This is what I want to get up to. So everybody is totally different, okay? Here are all the options that we currently offer. They might not, each of those options might not be okay for you, depending on your age, depending on your size, depending on whether you've had multiple surgeries before. The last two I've put down as well, because I think it's really important, because there are some people, so it talks about, so what I've got up there is dialysis, so it's hemodialysis, which means blood dialysis, <coughs> peritoneal dialysis, which is, a t which is a tube in your tummy. It's transplantation, so transplantation, as Jenny said, is having, a, having another kidney. I've also put up there supportive care, because some people decide that, no, actually, I don't want dialysis. And so long as they have been given all of the information and they can make a decision with their families and their doctors, that we will support the choice that you want. There are also other people who, as they get older and older, they may have started dialysis when they're 40, 50, 60, and at 80 or 85, or for some other reason they decide they want to pull out of dialysis. But if, if, they, if their decision is right and they're not clinically depressed, we will support them in that. Okay. Well, so when should dialysis start? And Simon said that, that, that what we're looking at is when your kidney function gets down to, you know, sort of 12 or 13, need to be starting about dialysis. We try and give people education a lot earlier than that. So we try and sort of look at people from when their kidney function gets down to, to 20 or less. And as you can see up there, I've already talked to you, I've already said that, you know, know what your EGFA is. Work with your doctor and make sure that you're looking after yourself, that you're the one in control and we will work with you. And I've put there that, that people who do decide to start dialysis, they, they usually start, used to be when your kidney function got down to 10, but it's really when the doctors, if, you, if you're failing to thrive, you're losing weight, you're not feeling well, and when the doctors recommend that that's the right time. So it may well be when the kidney function's got down to seven, depending on the person. Hey, I've got all that right without even reading it. Okay. <laughs> This is the whack, a whacking huge big slide and I'm really sorry. So are you happy if I sort of turn around and talk you through it? Okay, so at the top, at the top, CAPD, and we're really bad at using lots of very short terms. So CAPD means continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. APD is automated peritoneal dialysis. Home HD, and I've abbreviated that because it doesn't fit on the slide, home hemodialysis and in centre dialysis, okay? And the reason I've done it like that is very simply to make it as short as possible, but it didn't really work, okay? This is all available on uh, kidney.org.au. It's from My Kidneys, My Choice, so it's freely available and it's actually a really good um, educational brochure for both patients, their families, and the, the, your healthcare team because it can help you actually tighten up the things that you want, the things that you don't want, how something's going to fit into your life and how it's not. Can you read it from up there? Yeah. Okay, you're not going to get a chance now, I'm sorry. Okay, so I said peritoneal dialysis, two types, CAPD and APD. So on this side, the lady on this side is doing what we call CAPD, so four times a day she will put fluid in, so we need, she needs a catheter or a peri, a, also called a tenkoff catheter, into her stomach. And that goes in under surgery. Tube goes in, and four times a day, generally, special sterile fluid goes in, sits in there for a few hours, and then drains out. And then the whole process happens again. Okay? It takes about 30 to 40 minutes at a time to do what we call an exchange. So four exchanges a day for 30 to 40 minutes at a time. And when I teach people, I say, Sort of before breakfast, before you go to bed, because you're going to be home both those times, lunch time ish, and then the sort of dinner time ish. Okay? That will suit some people, but it won't suit everybody. And that's why you need to have the information so that you can talk to your doctor and your family about is this going to suit me? The other sort of peritoneal dialysis is called APD or automated, and you can see it uses a machine. It's about the size, I was going to say over an old video recorder, but some people here are too young to know what that is. Anyway, um, so, so, and that means that that's the peritoneal dialysis overnight, every night. So it's plugged in, right? 
and fluid goes in, sits in there for a while, drains out, goes in, sits there for a while, drains out, and that happens all overnight, between six and 10 hours, usually closer to eight, so sort of between eight and 10 hours, seven nights a week. So CAPD is seven days a week, APD is seven nights a week, all right? The advantage of seven <coughs> nights a week is you've got all your daytime free, the advantage of peritoneal dialysis overall is it's it's more consistent and more gentle than the hemodialysis. Oh, any questions? <coughs> Can you blame the We don't usually, we don't usually, but there is the potential. So somebody who usually dialyses um, on APD, if he or she's going away on holiday somewhere in Australia or overseas, it's easier to get bags delivered to um, wherever you're going on holiday. Does that? that Good question. Oh, I just talked about that already. The, the biggest thing about CIPD though is that the amount of fluid that has to go in your tummy. So if you've got the fluid going into your tummy and it's on average about two litres of fluid, you can imagine, feels uncomfortable, have to have elasticised clothes. Some people have a, a significant issue with body image and it doesn't matter whether you're a bloke or a girl or an old woman or a younger woman. Or, a, or an older man or a younger man, it doesn't matter. You know, it's it's really it's really important that if you if you're very conscious of your body image, this is one you need to consider that in the context of having peritoneal dialysis. Okay, you learn it in a week, so that is another huge advantage. Okay, APD. I've already told you about that. That was just another picture of what it look, of what it looks like. Again, you can learn that in a week. And as the gentleman asked before, is it possible to to swap? One, the one doing the manual, so the CAPD means no, you don't have any, don't need any machines, don't need any electricity. No questions? What? So I sort of tried to do just a really quick, here's, here's the advantages and disadvantages, so it's easy to, peritoneal dialysis, easy to learn, um, you can do it at work and home. I, I wouldn't encourage this, but we did have about, oh, 18 years ago, we had a young bloke who worked and were a council at Bega, and he used to do his exchanges, you're not listening to this Simon, he used to do his exchanges in the tractor. So, probably not the right person to do. Okay. And he never got the problem that I think I've got there, which was peritonitis. He never had a single dose of peritonitis because he looked after himself so well and he had, a, he had the cleanest tractor I've ever seen in my life. Nevertheless, okay. we don't no. encourage it. Right? I'm saying, and I didn't say it was 18 years ago, okay? Yeah. True? I covered myself there. Okay, the, the, you can see the problem, some of the other problems with PD is that some people can get a hernia, they can have some weight gain, and because the peritoneal cavity, or the, so the way that, that um, dialysis works with peritoneal dialysis, it uses the peritoneum, which is sort of the covering around all your organs, as the artificial kidney. Now, the peritoneum wasn't designed to be a kidney, so it actually has got a bit of a you know, a life. And we say, on average, two to five years, having said that, I know somebody who's had peritoneal dialysis for 12 years, and I've known somebody else who it didn't work with straight away. So there's a huge variety. You can move from one treatment to another. So somebody who starts dialysis, maybe on peritoneal dialysis, and that stops working, can move to hemodialysis, and then potentially if they if they're um, potential for a transplant, they can have a transplant. The transplant might work two years, five years, ten years, twenty years, and then they can come back to dialysis. So it's not a a one off. Oh, look at that. Okay, so hemodialysis uses an artificial kidney or a dialyzer, <coughs> and it uses blood. So that's the important thing. And the reason I've got this slide up is because um, this is put up by. I think it's Kidney Health Australia, and it's somebody doing it for himself. Because as I said, the most important thing is, if you're in control and you're running the thing, it actually, in better quality of life, you're independent and you've got a lot more, um, you've got a lot more say in what you're doing. Remember I said about these letters, so you've got HHD, home hemodialysis, NHD, nocturnal hemodialysis, so we have home hemodialysis, could be during the day or the evening. Nocturnal, people dialyse overnight. Community dialysis, which um, we've actually got a number of community dialysis centres in Canberra and over the border, just. And hospital hemodialysis, and I need, to I need to be really clear that hospital hemodialysis is only for really very acute 
um, people who need acute hemodialysis or those who are inpatients for hospital. We try and we try and ensure that people stay in the community. Okay, hey, it worked. Okay, so you can see there are lots of dialysis units in Canberra. Um, Thirty years ago, there was one. All right, so. It's important to know that you can have dialysis in Australia and overseas, so, so the, the information is there. Kidney.org.au is a really great website, even though it's hard to search through the stuff now. They are getting better. Okay, so home hemodialysis. Um, in order to find out whether somebody is suitable for home hemodialysis, they need to be assessed by the home dialysis nurses who actually have a training as a unit at Western Creek. And so people are assessed to see um, what their memory is like, what their, what their hands are like, because for hemodialysis to work, somebody needs a permanent access, a vascular access, which hopefully, um, Hopefully, is well organised and is, a, is called an AV fistula. I'm going to show you that. And I hope nobody's allergic to the sight of blood, but it's only pretend blood that's on the screen. Okay. Um, the training for home dialysis is Monday to Friday. Okay, and um, and you learn the practical side. Home hemodialysis does take, on average, about three months. So three times a week for three months. So that's that's where the difference between PD and hemodialysis training is. The reality of being at home means that um, if you're in a community dialysis centre, you dialyse Monday, Wednesday and Friday, morning or afternoon, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, morning or afternoon, and you're stuck into routine. If you're at home, you can, and you've negotiated, you negotiate with your consultant, okay, and, and the, um, the it can be, okay, well what I need you to do is I need you to dialyse a minimum, it may be a minimum of three times a week for a minimum of five hours. But the person who normally dialyses Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoon might go, actually Friday night, I'm going to go to the Brumbies, I don't want to dialyse Friday, I'll dialyse Saturday instead. Okay, so it's about having that, that greater control on your life. Okay, um, some people do find that the isolation is bad and <coughs> the isolation is hard because there's no one else around and uh, having the equipment there is hard. There are rebates for both electricity and uh, water in the ACT and, people, and anyone who's on home dialysis is on the vulnerable per person's list as well. Nobody's <coughs> asking any questions. <coughs> Sorry I'm racing through this but I'm very aware that um, you guys will want to get home. Okay, I've told you about the hospital hemodialysis, so very acute only, it's um, Monday to Saturday. Oh, guaranteed, so guaranteed has been for the last 30 years. Nobody, <coughs> nobody ever wants to be anywhere near nurses on Christmas Day, so we guarantee Christmas Day is the no dialysis day, we just reorganise everybody. And as much as possible, uh, sorry, and so apart from potentially Christmas Day, nobody dialyses Sundays either. So that's the, that's the only saving place, I think. Okay. Vascular access for hemodialysis. Okay, so the kidney doctor, so um, you may be, your kidney doctor at the moment may be with the private uh, group, um, Access Nephrology, or maybe with the public with. Um, with Simon and the rest of the guys, okay? If, you, if you're in Canberra Hospital, then the, the doctor, your consultant will liaise with the, with the dialysis access nurse, having discussed with you about having a fistula. What we try and do is we try and aim as much as possible for people to have their access on their non-dominant arm. So I'm right-handed, so I would have the, if I had an access, I'd have it on my left arm. Okay, you can have it lower arm, upper arm. So sometimes surgery doesn't, some surgery doesn't always work. If one fails, it is possible to put another one or another or another, okay. And the majority of the people that I've seen in dialysis are now getting older, so their veins aren't quite so good either. So that's a big issue. Okay, and as you can see, the, the dialysis and access nurse organises the interventions and you still see a consultant on a very regular basis. So this is a, a drawing of a fistula. So fistula actually means artery and vein joined together so that you get the flow. So I'll have to use my left arm, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so an artery and a vein joined together because whatever happens, you still want blood to come down to your hand and return back from your hand. 
So the artery and vein are joined together, often like this, or it could be as a T-junction. And what happens is that the vein, what we want to happen is we want the vein wall to build up. So it's thicker, so that every single hemodialysis, you have two cannulas in. One to take the blood from you, go through the machine, through the artificial dialyzer, remove the wastes, the excess fluid, and then return by the venous cannula. Okay? A lot of people who, some people are very needle phobic and we need, to, we need to get better at making sure that those people are actually taught with the psychologist to try and work to manage that phobia. Okay, fistula, the earliest really it should be used is about 12 weeks because it needs to have time to build that vein wall. That's the preferred one. So I, I don't know how that's come up. So you can see there, See, nobody's fainted yet? Good. Okay, so you can see there that that's somebody who's, who's got two cannulas in, so one would have, one to remove the blood, one to return the clean blood, and the other one is somebody's mature fistula. Sometimes they develop aneurysms and sometimes they don't look quite so sightly, and so that's where the decision about peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis also <coughs> needs to be considered. If somebody hasn't had fistula put in, or their veins are, are, are very poor, sometimes they might need to have a graft. And a graft is a piece of synthetic tubing under the skin, an artery joint to, joint to the vein. It can be used in a couple of weeks. Because it's synthetic, there is more chance of infection. It doesn't last as long. Um, I've seen fistulas that have lasted for 18, 20 years, and, some, and certainly they last a lot longer than the, the grafts. You haven't corrected me on anything yet. Jeez, okay, I'm getting well. Okay, I'm, I must be doing all right. Okay, um, this, sometimes people either haven't made decision about dialysis, about what sort of dialysis, or they become acutely unwell, or their permanent access has stopped working and they might need a central venous catheter. So that's a, a line, a line in here, which does the same thing as the fistula, just nowhere near as well, and of course it's another access in, so that it means that there's more potential for infection. We would like to avoid those as much as possible. And so would you, because they are so unsightly. It's damn hard to have, for people to have a shower as well. Okay, remember I said some self cannulation If you can do it yourself, that's fantastic. Um, I think there's at least one person here who would, who would agree with me to say that the nurses, most of the nurses are pretty damn good at putting cannulas in. However, once somebody's learned how to do it themselves, even if they have to go, um, even if they have to go into hospital or somewhere else, they'd much prefer to put the cannulas in themselves because they can feel it better. Okay, so it's really important that you know that. So that's what we encourage the, as the looking after yourself. Um, so making sure, it, and the important thing is obviously you want to you want to make sure this is working all the time. So you want to make sure it doesn't get infected, it doesn't get cold, it doesn't get hard, that your hand's working properly, that, that everything is working well. Okay, and we obviously, sorry, I forgot to tell you, so, because I missed it, I was jumping ahead too fast. Okay, so if, we, if someone's going to have a fistula or a graft in their non-dominant left arm, we don't want anybody to take blood pressure or take any blood from their arm because we want to make sure the vessels are the best they can be. So if, some, so if somebody asks, me, so if I need dialysis and my left arm is the one they're going to, put a, uh, um, going to do the fistula in, I'm going to say, you're not taking it from my left arm, it's going to go to my right. Okay? And just get really, really um, bossy about doing that because you're looking after you. Okay. Um, and it was fantastic listening to, to Corey and Jenny. Um, so th there are three different types of transplants. There are transplants from deceased donors. Tra I can never remember this. Transplants from deceased donors, transplants from live donors, and you heard from these guys. And there's also one called the Pear Kidney Exchange. There's probably been, what, 120, 130 people have done that. So, so the different, so deceased donors, we certainly don't have enough people on the organ donor register for starters, so that's a big issue. I think there, there's in the range about 1,800 people a year who need a transplant and we don't, certainly don't have anywhere near that many. 
Um, as Corey said, with the live kidney donation, it means it's planned, all the tests have gone ahead, and there are multiple tests. It's seen it's, it's each individual person has his or her own doctor, they have psych tests, they have tests, it's the most thorough medical that a potential donor may have. Um, from basically from head to foot, isn't it? Because it's, it's your head, it's making sure the vessels are in the right place, it's making sure that if one kidney is removed, then the other kidney is going to be okay for the rest of your life. So there's lots and lots of things to, to be considered and people really go through, I was going to say the mill, they, it, it's really important that, that it's explored totally that, that the person actually wants to give. And both the potential donor and potential recipient can pull out, okay? Because if they don't feel right about having a, a transplant at the time, it's a huge amount of work and a lot of money that is put into, into testing people for both becoming a donor or a recipient. So that's why we try and do all the tests and make sure that somebody has decided that this is the right thing to do for them. The paired kidney exchange happens in the case that my husband wants to give me a kidney and we're not compatible and somebody else's husband wants to give them a kidney and they're not compatible. So it's sort of like a swap, okay? Which means that two families benefit. And it's been going on now for 10 years, more or less, eight, isn't that long? Anyway, okay, so in Australia and overseas and, and so the only thing that Canberra doesn't do is actually the transplant itself, okay? So the people from Canberra, either if they work managed within Canberra Hospital, they go to Westmead and if they manage to access nephrology, they go to the Royal North Shore. Okay. I don't have any questions yet. So as Simon said, transplant's the best quality of life, it's the best treatment, and if, if at all possible, you need, to, you need to get all the information, you need to discuss with your doctor whether it is actually a possibility, it won't be for everybody though, and that's the discussion that you will have with your nephrologist. Um, in the very early days, so in the first couple of weeks after the transplant, most people are back in Canberra, uh, sort of within three to four weeks after transplant, if not earlier, and they have appointments at least three times a week because we need to make sure that their bloods are okay, that their medications need to, don't need to be changed. And that's why in that first six, the first three months is particularly intense, but then it drops off. So Jenny, how often would you see jobs? They are, so once, to, to once every three months. But a living transplant um, has also a much longer longevity. I think in Australia, the, the, longest, the person with the longest surviving kidney is about, uh, the kidney itself is, transplant kidney itself has been 52 years in that person. And this is a lady in Western Australia. Of course, there's, a, well, there's are also problems. Um, because because the cancer drug uh, sorry because the drugs are immunosuppressants and if you have immunosuppressants there is actually a, a higher um, rate of cancers particularly skin cancers. Mm -hmm. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do it. <laughs> So handouts from Polycystic Kidney Disease from Kidney Health Australia, so there's enough for everybody if you want to know. Sorry, John. Okay, let's move on please to uh, Simon's second uh, talk, which is on the research side of um, polycystic kidney disease. So, yeah. Simon. Yeah. I, I think I'll probably just I'll correct, but just, uh, add, yeah, a little, I'll just add one. No, 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 actually, not correct. So you just uh, add on one little bit um, about the, the choices of the dialysis transplant. So. All of the kidney specialists would, if, if it's feasible, go for transplant as the first line, mainly because not just quality of life, the life expectancy uh, is highest um, by a long margin uh, with kidney transplantation. So if, we, if it's possible, we will always go for a kidney transplant or should try and go for a kidney transplant. In the absence, for instance, of a suitable donor, um, or if, I actually find your story phenomenal because I've been, you know, looking looking after donors, uh, worked in our around that time, around that time for the transplant actually. <coughs> Altruistic donors are very rare, 
very, very rare. So I actually think that's kind of it's actually quite phenomenal. They're very rare. I, I, I can think of maybe one or two disciples that I've met uh, or heard of in my career. So, but in the absence of finding, luckily, and finding a donor, uh, home dialysis is probably going to, or, or um, home dialysis, nocturnal dialysis, is probably going to offer the best in terms of longevity or improving your life expectancy. Because with kidney, when you have a kidney transplant, you have, you kind of constantly at a very high level of kidney function. When you come in to do intermittent hemodialysis three times a week, it basically equates to having about four or five mils per minute. And that's what we give you with hemodialysis, not to keep you safe, but it's about four or five mils per minute. If you are actually able to do the nighttime dialysis or dialyze at home a bit more regularly, then you end up giving yourself equivalent kidney function not too dissimilar to a kidney transplant. And what that actually means in a lot of the studies, the big coats studies of, of, of people on nighttime dialysis, is their life expectancy is not far off from kidney transplant. So if you don't have a kidney transplant, dialyzing at home and frequently um, at night time is probably going to be a very good second option while you're waiting perhaps on the deceased donor list for a kidney to come up and the median <coughs> waits for about three, three and a half years. Uh, PD and then PD and HD, life expectancy is going to be pretty similar. Um, the intermittent hemodialysis and CAPD. So I think the one thing I just wanted to, to add on is that the, the live donor, um, as Corey mentioned, is actually the best because <coughs> the grafts don't reject as much. They last a lot longer. Um, because, you know, when the kid is taken out, if it's kept on ice for a long period of time, it becomes, for lack of a better term, cranky. And you put it in, and then the immune system of the recipient suddenly go, oh, what's this angry thing you just put in me? So if it's coming from Perth and it's on ice for 12 hours, they generally, they get an injury, it awakens the immune system, and then rejection is a, is a much bigger problem, and the graft doesn't tend to last as long. In, under controlled conditions of live donation, paired kidney donation, it's out and in in a short period of time. Can, and outcomes are just a lot better across the board. So live donation is one, deceased donation would be two, three would be at home dialysis, hemodialysis because of its benefit on life and life expectancy and quality of life. And then after that, the other two, you know, kind of equivalent in terms of outcomes really a personal choice.